I'm Rob Hallam and welcome to another edition of Car File. Now this week's programme is a little bit special and just the thing for those of you out there who like your cars fast and powerful. There's certainly nothing ordinary about this week's range of cars and as always we've picked a good wide range of showroom prices so there should be something to tempt everyone. So we're going to start the show with a real blast as Richard Hammond flies in with our awesome supercar challenger the Subaru Impreza. Then in complete defiance of the grotty weather we've been having recently although it is quite nice today Elisa Portelli and Ginny Buckley well they'll be letting the wind and probably rain and snow in the hair with the MGF and the lovely Porsche Boxster. Plus, Ken Gibson has been fortunate enough to get behind the wheel of that Japanese computer controlled supercar, the Nissan Skyline. The Subaru Impreza has long since proven that you really can have your cake and eat it, despite what your parents used to tell you. Look at it, it's positively practical, it's subdued, it barely stands out from the crowd. It's got four doors, you can fit the kids in the back, and there's a lockable boot at the very back to keep your valuables safe. It also has an irritating habit, certainly from the viewpoint of other manufacturers, of consistently coming first year in, year out in a certain well-known survey that looks at reliability. Subaru Impreza's really don't break down. Neither did they break the bank at about 23 grand for this one. That's what, posh rep car money, really. And for that, what do you get? Well, aside from all that practicality, it also has nestling under this bonnet, well, there's a few hints with all these holes and scoops on here. There is a flat four configuration, two litre boxer engine, turboed, putting out a Nadja's over 200 brake horsepower. That in turn is linked to a permanent all-wheel drive system developed from their enormous rallying success, at which they win year in, year out, all over the world. It is an absolute storm to drive. But even that isn't enough for everyone. Because it's the way of the world, isn't it? There's always somebody who wants to go that one step further. And though this may look the same as the previous car, it isn't. Because as the Impreza has risen to prominence and found favour in UK markets, so we're starting to see the derivatives finding favour. And I don't just mean sticking on a set of fluffy dice and plastic wheel arches. I mean substantial changes to the car. Look in any motoring-related magazines and you'll see the kind of stuff I'm talking about. This, for instance, is an STIRA version. It's just one of many modified versions. And it goes all the way right underneath because the engine has been chipped. It's now putting out about 280 brake horsepower. Modifications are often made to the suspension with aluminium components, aluminium bonnets, aluminium boot. Huge changes to these things. In fact, a lot of them, like this one, are not very far at all from being a Group N rally car. Do not expect to climb on board a Subaru Impreza and be dazzled by the vibrant interior, because it ain't. It's very, very bland. It's as exciting as pulling on a pair of crimpling slacks. Not that I ever have, ever. However, as soon as you pull away, things get a little bit more interesting. That flat four boxer configuration engine has got a beautiful, soft, burbling note at idle. As soon as you pull away and give it a bit, uh, it starts to sound fantastic with a really satisfying roar and plenty of power. But the overwhelming impression is one of control of that power because of the extreme capability of the all-wheel drive system and the torque of the engine, it feels very nimble, it feels very small, everything feels within your reach, it feels like a very fast and a very capable car but not like a car that's going to get away from you. That four-wheel drive system of course has very real uses when the weather comes in like this and it's not too pleasant, it will keep you going in the right direction. But you've always got to bear in mind that this is a very powerful car with over 200 brake horsepower going to those four wheels. If you hit your nice greasy country road, you could get yourself into trouble. And then there's this, the modified version, in which you can definitely get yourself into quite a lot of trouble very quickly. This one's been upgraded to about 280 brake horsepower, give a few. By quite a lot of modification to the engine management system, it has been chipped, as they say, and also there is even a water spray system on the intercooler, operated by a dashboard mounted button, which really does put things into Looney Tunes territory. It is as close as you can get to a Group N rally car on the road. The ride is pretty jarring and crashing. It's extraordinarily purposeful, shall we say. There's all the noises from the drivetrain, from the transmission, it whines. There's huge noises from the engine, from the turbo, you do feel like you're driving a rally car. It is enormous fun, 
though perhaps not as user friendly and it makes the standard Impreza feel like a nice big friendly puppy. Provided you don't mind driving around in a supercar that looks like a shopping car, then the Subaru Impreza Turbo is unique. You can drop the kids off at school, head out into the countryside and pretend you're a rally driver. Not only that, you can continue doing it for years and years without worrying because it won't break down. They don't. And also, when you come to sell it in a few years, well, there's another pleasant surprise awaiting in that you won't have lost a fortune. The residual values are fantastic. Somewhat less compromised and less easy to use every day then is this, in this instance, the STI RA, really representing any modified Subaru Impreza. And it kind of gets away from the idea of practicality with performance to concentrate on just the performance to give you a breathtaking drive. Ultimately, it's got to be a case of horses for courses. Or you could say, if this one says you can have your cake and eat it, this one says you can keep your cake and stick it. Roadsters, that quintessential part of summer motoring that seemed to die out in the 80s, came back with a vengeance in the 90s. Cars which helped to revive this concept include the BMW Z3, the Mazda MX-5 and this, Rover's MGF. Now whilst talking history, we could look back at 75 years of MGs. Ask anyone around then what image they have of the Roadster and the chances are they will see an MGB. So, Rover could do no wrong when they launched the MGF four years ago. This is the MGF as it is today, complete with facelift and a few extra bulges in all the right places. From this exterior, you could be forgiven in thinking that nothing much has changed. The windscreen surround now matches the body colour and out with the orange as the indicator lenses are now fashionably smoked. Other than that, the styling remains the same as it was, with these retro cues in the headlights and grille to evoke the old bees. Any other drastic changes would have meant maybe MGF losing its look of heritage and coming from Rover, heaven forbid. In here, the changes are just as minimal. Rover has taken the striking chrome and allen key design from outside and applied it to the gear stick and surround. And even the speakers have a fancy trim around them. Chrome stays inside as the dials now have a lovely silver finish to them. And in answer to customer criticism, the steering column is now adjustable. The MGF's cabin really is a pleasant place to sit. The light colours are very refreshing and make a change from the usual swathes of black and grey plastic. Plenty of thought has gone into coordinating the MGF's trim and it really shows. In addition, this car must go down as one of the best built MGs ever. All the work that Rover and BMW have put together in improving build quality has certainly paid off. This car feels really well put together, with quality plastics and not a rattle to be heard. Now obviously a roadster is not a roadster unless you can lose that hood and feel the wind through your hair and the sun on your face. And any sun seekers out there will appreciate the ease of lowering this hood. Just release the two catches, down it drops and off you go. On the road, the MGF shifts along quite nicely. This 1.8 litre engine remains the same, with the option of the VVC engine, which stands for Variable Valve Control for any of you non-technical types out there. Basically, it's there to ensure that you get the performance at the top end without losing the thrust at the traffic lights. Basically, it's an all-round good performer and you won't be disappointed. With that in place, MGF can get you from 0 to 60 quite happily in 8.5 seconds and it has a top speed of around 120 miles per hour. The MGF is a good performer and you have the grunt of that VVC engine behind you, but it doesn't feel as fast as it should do, even though the figures state good performance. It tends to lack a sense of occasion, like for example the BMW Z3. There are plenty of options, as is often the case when buying a new car these days, to personalise your own. Hundreds of colours and accessories ensure you can get more out of your MGF than those that came before it. But surely the whole point of a roadster is for a blast around the country lanes on a sunny weekend. How times have changed. 
MG originally started by producing cheap, affordable and extremely popular sports cars. Now there's no doubt in the popularity of the MGF or its capability as a car, but as a sports car I feel it fails to make a convincing case, especially when up against its predecessors. Arguably, there isn't a place in the modern automotive world for the MG to compete head-to-head -head with their parent company's BMW Z3, unless, of course, you're a sucker for classics. It is therefore left to the MGF to fulfil a rather different role. If it's the sports car look that you're after, but with few of the sports car compromises, then this is the car for you. Personally, though, I've never looked at the Roadster as being a luggage carrier. To me, I would rather keep those left to the people carriers. Well, that's it for part one, and there's just enough time to get your breath back, because right after the break, we've got the Nissan Skyline, the Porsche Boxster, and I'll be bringing things down to a more sedate level with a nice little estate car. We'll see you in a bit. Now, I don't know about you, but after a while, all these 0-60 before you can blink high-powered supercars, well, they get a little bit too much. So I think to bring the show nicely back down to earth, what more could you ask for than a lovely, Audi Estate. This is the A4, it's nice subtle lines, no silly bonnet vents or flared out wheel arches and absolutely none of those nasty tail spoilers. In fact it's pretty safe to say that this car would be perfect for your rep who's doing quite well for himself or maybe even for taking your little middle class dog for a walk on a middle class Sunday afternoon. But not quite because this car is a little bit special and the only way you can tell is the little S badge on the back because if an Audi's got an S on it, well, it's like the M on a BMW or the RS on a Ford. You know it's going to be a monster. And the only way you can tell is to give it a drive. Now the reason this fairly ordinary looking Audi leaps into life when you put your foot down is because under the bonnet is a 2.7 litre V6 bi-turbo engine, kicking out 265 brake horsepower. And because it's a bi-turbo or twin turbo, it means the power comes in much earlier in the rev range. So in almost any gear, put your foot down and try and stop yourself grilling like a fool. And what does it cost? Well, in standard trim, the S4 will set you back £38,000. But the model we've got today has got extras such as satellite navigation, TV tuner and of course those lovely seats and that'll set you back 44 grand. Now as with all of Audi's S cars that superb engine is linked to the legendary Quattro four wheel drive system. Now that means you can have a load of fun in the corners as well as on a straight line while well, sticking to all the speed limits of course. And the very fact that this is an Audi well it means that bits aren't going to start falling off once you're abusing the gas pedal. It's actually a little bit strange, I think, the fact that this car is so powerful and yet it looks so ordinary. I mean, 0 to 60 time is about five and a half seconds, which isn't that much slower than the BMW M3, and it's quicker than some of the Porsche Carreras, and both of those cars look like out and out performance vehicles. So that begs the question, who on earth is gonna spend an extra eight grand on this car over a regular A4 Quattro for something that looks exactly the same? So how do you best sum up this car? Well, if it's out and out performance that you're interested in, then this is going to fit the bill. In fact, it's going to be very, very impressive. But if you want impressive performance and you want to impress the neighbours, you might be a little bit disappointed, unless, of course, you give them a lift home from work. What price would you put on one extra gear, 32 brake horsepower and eight miles an hour? Hard to say? Well, Porsche reckon that it's worth almost eight grand. Because that's how much more you'll have to pay to swap your basic Boxster for this, the Boxster S. Now, visually, you wouldn't be able to tell the two cars apart. That's because all the changes to the Boxster S are under the skin. And those changes have transformed the Boxster from a great sports car into an absolutely superb one. The kind of car that makes sticking to the speed limits very difficult indeed. And it isn't just the engine that's been worked on. 
Porsche have made revisions to the suspension and the chassis. The shocks and springs are now much firmer and the rear axle now has wheel mounts and guiding elements to help you get the most out of the car's performance. The Boxster's flat six now displaces 3.2 litres and of course with incredible performance like that you need some pretty incredible brakes to go with it and the Boxster S has got an all new braking system based on the 911 Carreras. Still features ABS as standard but the wheel discs are now larger and wider and they've been cross drilled so that you're guaranteed fantastic braking even in the worst conditions. Shall we? Should we give it a try? Are you ready? Oh, lovely. And I think we can safely say that they work just about fine. The S has got the extra gear that I mentioned earlier, and if you fancy it, then there's a Tiptronic option you can go for that lets you play at being a racing driver. It does, however, slightly reduce the performance, but as 0 to 60 only takes half a second more, I don't think you'll lose much sleep over it. Now, I know that talking about this car is beginning to make me sound like an infatuated teenager, so I've been trying to be practical and think about some of the bad points, and the best I can come up with is that the interior doesn't really feel like it belongs in a £42,000 car, and there aren't that many storage spaces in here for all your bits and pieces. What can I say? It's a great car! I've got to say, I really do love this car. If it was a man, I'd have it down the altar by now, kicking and screaming. It feels fantastic to drive. It's taut, it's firm, and even at high speeds, it feels incredibly solid and stable. Those massive 18-inch wheels aren't going anywhere other than the direction that you point them in. The steering is responsive, it's got bags of feedback, it's just an all-round blast to drive, and it's topped off by the sound that comes out of the exhaust. Oh, I could listen to that all day. It sounds amazing. So is this wolf in sheep's clothing worth it? Well, that depends on how much one extra gear, 32 brake horsepower and 8 miles an hour is worth to you. Would you splash out on the Boxster S or would you buy the basic Boxster and still have enough spare change to buy a brand new Volkswagen Lupo as well? Now, this has to be the ideal parking spot for a Nissan Skyline, a helicopter pad, because this is as near as you're going to get to being airborne on four wheels. The Skyline is an absolute flying machine. This car is a petrol head's dream. It's macho with a big, big capital M. Everywhere you look on it, it's got huge spoilers, side sills. The wheel arches are massive, but then a need to be. We're talking about 18 inch wheels here. It's got Brembo brakes on it. When you put the foot on those, it's like dropping an anchor. Everywhere it looks, it looks muscle. It looks as if it's powerful and dangerous. And then you finally come back to the old aeronautical touch, this huge rear spoiler that looks as if it could fit very happily onto the back of a Boeing 747. But actually, it's rather practical because this mechanism here helps keep the stability down and actually keep you back on the ground. Here we've got about five or six horses Inside of here, we've got 277 horses. Sadly, no car is perfect. And if this wonderful Nissan has one failing, it's the interior. It doesn't feel or look like a 54 grand car. A lot of it is standard stock. The only difference is this Nintendo-like machine with all of the information on the screen. That said, the seats are wonderfully comfortable. They're very good in the back as well, so you can actually put the fear of God up to three people in one go. But in many ways, I'd forgive Nissan anything for this car, and it's quite livable with, and it's very practical. Floor the accelerator in this machine, and it's like lift off at Cape Canaveral. 
It's absolutely superb. Mind you, it's no bloody surprise, really. Nought to 60 takes just 4.5 seconds. Nought to 100 will take you 10.5 if you really put your foot down. And that is just amazing performance. It's got more technology underneath here than you've got in your average computer center. There's multi-link suspension, front and back. There's a computer-controlled four-wheel drive system that controls the car so well that, to be honest, you're not quite sure whether the computer's driving the car or you're driving it. The great news is, though, you feel absolutely wonderful. Driving this, I feel as if I'm Michael Schumacher. Cornering is like going around on rails. But amazingly, you really have to concentrate. This is about as near as you can get to driving a rally car. The ride is rock hard. You feel every bump as you go along the road. But it just adds to the adrenaline rush. It is just such a buzz. This is untrue. I feel like some young kid again. It is just sensational. This is the fastest drive I have ever had in my life. Top speed limited to 155 miles an hour, which is actually probably a good idea because you can lose your license in this car very easily just going from 0 to 100. Whatever your favorite ride in a theme park has been, forget about it because the skyline gives you your very own everyday theme park. After a burst in this, you'll never ever want to go to Blackpool or Alton Towers again. Down in the supercar jungle, there's an all new king, and that's the Nissan GTR. Forget all about your Ferraris, your Porsches, they're as common as muck, and when it comes to sheer speed and brute force, this big baby will leave them standing.